Disco Instructor Andrea here, and this is going to be a video review of the Network Security Fundamentals module in the Introduction to Networks. Let's get started. We're going to be looking at different security threats, vulnerabilities, and physical threats. Some examples of a security threat would be information theft, data loss and manipulation, identity theft, and disruption of service. You may be familiar with some of these. Uh, as you may be aware, especially if you are in this spring 2021 class, we at Maricopa Community Colleges just had some sort of a security breach. We don't really know all of the details, but we know that it took down all of our networks and it caused a major disruption of service. The types of vulnerabilities that we want to think about are technological vulnerabilities, configuration vulnerabilities, and then how are our security policies? Do we have vulnerabilities because we don't have strong security policies? There's also physical threats. Um, hardware could be damaged, environmental problems. If you have a leak in your room and you get rain damaged, that could be a real problem. Or any type of plumbing fixtures that may break down, you could have serious issues. Fire, electrical hazards, um, and then just general maintenance. All of these are the different types of threats that you want to think about. When we look deeper at the security threats and vulnerabilities, often there will be a person or some sort of an entity or group behind it. What would we call that? We would call that a threat actor or threat actors. So these are usually nefarious people that are behind these disruption of service or a theft of data. And so it's important that you protect your networks and you protect your end and inter intermediary devices from these people. So we're going to look at these vulnerabilities a little bit deeper. So you might think of, you know, breaking into a computer to steal confidential information. We would refer to that as information theft, just like if you were going into a store and stealing a pair of glasses. Here we're stealing data, we're stealing information. Uh, if we're going to break or destroy or alter records. So we could have a threat actor that's not really stealing anything, but getting in to the data and manipulating it to cause it to look differently. So that would be data loss or manipulation. Another form of theft that would relate specifically to our identity or to personal information, and that would be identity theft, right? And that can happen in a lot of different ways, but it certainly is a, a computer is certainly an area of vulnerability. And then finally, a total disruption of service, which is preventing authorized users, people that should be allowed to get onto a network from getting on a network. And there's all different ways to disrupt service. The different types of vulnerabilities usually are related to a weakness in your actual network or on a device. Um, we've been talking a lot about switches in this particular semester, and we've also started talking about routers, but we've talked a lot about how switches and the different types of vulnerabilities that a switch has. One of the reasons is because a switch just comes right out of the box working, right? There's also a lot of ports. So there are areas of vulnerability. So you wanna think about that from a network administrator perspective. So there's three primary vulnerabilities, a technology vulnerability, right? This would include a TCP IP protocol weakness, um, operating systems, and that could be operating systems at the network level or at the end device level. Uh, configuration vulnerabilities. Have you configured the right passwords? Have you encrypted things that need to be encrypted? Have you shut down ports? Have you uh, blocked people from accessing your network that shouldn't be getting into your network? And then finally, setting up security policies. In this particular class, we haven't talked as much about that. However, as we move into the second Cisco class and the third Cisco class, we'll talk more about security policies and um, how, how we would manage that and then mitigate different vulnerabilities by having strong security policies. These three sources of vulnerabilities can leave your network open to a lot of different attacks. 
um, and basically just leave you vulnerable to malicious codes, um, malicious people. So these are some of the different vulnerabilities you want to take into consideration as you become a network administrator or even if you're the first line of defense. There's four different classes of physical threats and we actually mentioned them so we're going to just break them down a little bit more. We've got hardware threats, right? That's if your intermediary devices like routers or switches get damaged. You have bad cabling. So that could be that your cables are damaged or it's just been a really bad cabling job. Environmental threats, is something too hot? Is something too cold? Um, is there a fire in the area? Has there been rain? Is there humidity? Do you have the right type of cooling system, the right dehumidifying system? Electrical threats, so there's a lot of different things that could cause this. You know, are, is your equipment grounded properly? Um, are there electrical storms? Do you have brownouts or blackouts wherever you are? And then poor maintenance threats. Um, do people have access to your network that shouldn't have access? Do you have key card access? Are the right people that know how to work on your equipment working on your equipment? Do you have the right type of equipment available in order to fix things if something needs to get fixed? So you do want to think about protecting your physical space, having a locked door, having key access, specific people that are authorized to enter your server rooms and your network rooms. Uh, here's an example of a really poor cabling job. This could lead to a lot of problems. One is it's a safety hazard. It would be easy for a person to get tangled up in there. Cables could even get ripped out. It would be really hard to trace what you need would need to fix. Here's an example of a server room that had caught fire. And you can see how these devices have been melted. Hopefully, this network administrator has implemented some additional security by having a good backup system. Typically, companies are going to have an organizational policy around how to maintain equipment and what type of security policy should be in place, uh, vulnerability mitigation, etc. So just to review, we went over security threats, vulnerability, and physical threats. Next, we're going to be looking at network attacks. One of your primary jobs as a network administrator or working within a team of network administrators is going to be to mitigate network attacks. You know, thinking about from the inside out as well as the outside in. Cybersecurity. Really, cybersecurity is a fancy way of saying protect your network, right? Protect your network. Let's take a look at some of these different network attacks and then we'll break them down. So one of the first ones that we may be the most aware of because we hear about it is malware. Malware is going to be things like viruses, worms, Trojan horses, ransomware. A recon attack, that's a reconnaissance attack. Really recon attack might not be an actual attack. It's more like gathering intel. Right, so the nefarious threat actor is maybe doing internet queries, ping sweeps, they're scanning to see what ports are open, and in general, gathering information in whatever way they can. And that could even be just calling up and trying to talk to an employee that is unsuspecting and sharing information. Then we've got the actual access attack. An access attack is when that threat actor is attempting to attack your passwords, determine what your passwords are. They're violating trust and they've gotten into an area and, uh, of trust and now they can get into other areas. Port redirection and man-in-the-middle attacks. And then finally, we've got the denial of service. Again, this is a, just a disruption of service that could bring your network down and prevent users from getting into your network that should be allowed to get in your network. That includes ping of death, SYN floods, DDoS attacks, and Smurf attacks. We'll break each of these down. So as we move through some of these slides, I want you to think about and see if you know the answer to some of these. So let's look at a network attack. Name three types of malware. 
I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about that. Here's the first one. It will corrupt and modify files on a target computer. What do you think that is? It is a virus. So a virus will insert a copy of itself and it will become part of that program. And then if you share it, it's going to be shared with whoever your computer has come in contact with, either through sending an email or sending data, just like a flu virus, okay? How about this next one? Travels through networks relies on security failures to spread itself to other computers. So this is going to be if you're not updating your computer, you're not putting security patches in. What do you think this malware is? So this is a worm. Worms will replicate functional copies of themselves. And then they will, they stand alone by themselves, unlike a virus, right? This will be a standalone little program that will replicate and then get shared, okay? Lastly, this one's maybe a little bit easier to tell from the definition. Hides inside a normal looking program. Creates a back door to infected computers. This is commonly shared through emails. Did you think Trojan horse? Then you're right. A Trojan horse is a harmful piece of software that looks legitimate. It'll say, open me. And then it will spread through the user interactions, such as running a file from the internet. So there's our three main types of malware. Again, this would be a network attack. Often our end devices are the target devices. Not always, but most often. In addition to malicious code attacks like malware, it's also possible for networks to fall prey to other types of network attacks. So network attacks can be classified into three major categories. Again, I want you to take a few seconds and I want you to think about what you maybe have read or what we've been talking about in class and see if you know these three major categories. Okay, we've got a denial of service the recon attack, and the access attacks. So I want you to do the matching here. Match the attack to the description. The studying or mapping of a network, the unauthorized manipulation of systems, user privileges, and data, the disabling or corrupting the network and its system. So let's take the first one, the studying or mapping of the network. Did you think recon attack? Again, this might not be an actual attack. This is more gathering information, right? Doing ping sweeps, port scans, gathering intelligence. This will be stuff that the threat actor uses to attack the network, to run an access attack to do a denial of service, to know what end devices to send the malware to. Next, the unauthorized manipulation of systems, user privileges, and data. Does that one sound familiar from a previous slide? That is an access attack. It is an access attack. And then lastly, disabling or corrupting the network and its systems. The key word here is disabling. If I disable it, I'm denying service. Okay. So what is the discovery and the mapping of systems and services or vulnerabilities? What kind of attack do we call this? Remember, the goal here is to acquire enough information to find where the vulnerabilities in your network is, then do the actual attack. So did you think reconnaissance attack? If you did, then you're absolutely right. So this is really, again, not an attack. I'm gathering information. The different ways that that can be done is just through phone calls, looking at stuff that's left out or exposed, internet queries, ping sweeps, 
port scans, it's all different ways that threat actors can gather information to know what network and what end devices to attack. Here's a true or false question for you. For a reconnaissance attack, external attackers can use internet tools such as NSLOOKUP and the what is utility. They will use these to easily determine the IP address space assigned to a given corporation or entity. Now you want to break this question down because it's a little bit tricky. Initially, this seems true because I know that NSLOOKUP can be used. And then I think and I look at that what is. Is that really what it is? Have you ever heard of a what is utility? I haven't. The utility is actually who is. So you do want to know your different DOS commands and your different commands that you can use within your command line of your routers and switches. The reconnaissance attack, remember, they're just gathering information. Port scanners and packet sniffers can also be used. So a port scanner is going to look for open ports on your network. A packet sniffer would be something like Wireshark, where they can use packet a packet sniffer like Wireshark to look inside of the frames and to look inside of the headers to gather information. Remember, another common way for reconnaissance attacks to happen is just to have phone conversations. A person will call up and pretend to be another employee, pretend to be a manager, pretend to be a customer in order to gather information. I want you to name two of the four types of a common access attack. So there's four access attacks. Can you think of at least two of the four? These can be classified into four different types. A password attack, a trust exploitation, port redirection, and a man in the middle. So again, this is actually gaining access into our networks. So we've now moved beyond the reconnaissance attack. We're using the information we've gathered from our reconnaissance attack to actually make an attack. So these attacks typically happen against known vulnerabilities, which are either just openly out there because an operating system might be letting you know, right? Or it could be because it's been, Intel has been gathered. The goal is to gain access to information that the threat actor has no right to. An example of a password attack is if the network administrator doesn't change the well-known passwords and the well-known usernames to more complicated usernames and more complicated passwords. Those are easy. Now, a trust exploitation is when a person, a threat actor, can gain access to an area that they're allowed perhaps to get access into. Well, then they begin to look for vulnerabilities, like they start attacking other areas that they don't have access to. And because of the area that they are trusted to go into, they're able to exploit other areas. So again, we can see here, this person can get into system B. So now they have access to system A. This would be a trust exploitation. Like I said before, this, these types of access attacks are typically after a reconnaissance attack. Two other attacks that we mentioned is port redirection and a man in the middle. So a port redirection is when the threat actor uses the compromise system for the attack and they will, information or data will come into one port and let's say it's supposed to go to a particular switch. The threat actor will redirect that data to their own device, then they will take the data or replicate the data. Now often they'll go ahead and just forward the data on to the correct destination. 
that makes it more difficult to find the problem and to even know that there is a problem. So again, they're redirecting the ports, okay? Then we have a man in the middle. A man in the middle is gonna be similar to the port redirection. The threat actor will position themselves in between two legitimate entities or two legitimate devices, two legitimate networks. They will then read the data, steal the data, or they'll modify it in order to put their own information in there. And then it gets shared and passed. Let's look at this question. What type of attack is designed to overload resources such as disk space, bandwidth, and or pings of death? So did you think about a disruption of service and what that might look like? So a denial of service will disrupt your service, right? And it could bring your whole system down. So a, de a denial of service attacks are difficult to eliminate. Sometimes it requires you to start shutting down different pieces of your network and then bringing them back up. Overload of resources. So your network could still work. However, the bandwidth gets ratcheted down because your network is so congested that it causes really high latency. Buffers can be overloaded. Storage can be overloaded. You could start getting just pings after pings. If you think about what we've learned about broadcasting, right? We know that broadcasting happens at layer two. I can send broadcast messages. I can send broadcast pings. Well, if that is taking up my network for all these broadcasts and my tables are having to constantly fill and then empty, fill and then empty, this is going to cause a denial of service. So again, a denial of service is ultimately preventing legitimate users on your network from being able to access the systems. I wanna again, just bring your attention back. If you are in the semester of spring 2021, in March, Maricopa Community Colleges underwent a very severe cyber attack. Again, that information hasn't been shared with us. However, it was a denial of service. It prevented students, faculty, administrators, there was a full denial of service to access to all of our systems. These are very serious, serious threats. It will interrupt communications. Obviously, it causes a loss of time, a loss of money. Uh, they are easy. Unfortunately, a denial of service attack is fairly easy. And these really bad people will do denial of services as they're practicing and trying to get into different networks. To help prevent DOS attacks, it's important to keep all of your systems updated, your network equipment, as well as your end devices. So here we have an example of a threat actor, right down here is our threat actor, and they're doing a relatively easy denial of service attack. They're doing like a ping of death where they're just maximizing pings. They're sending these pings out. The pings go out over all of the links, causing so much congestion and latency that legitimate users are not able to get into the intranet or their internet services. There's different types of denial of service attacks. Common DOS attacks would be a ping of death, sin flood, the SYN flood is the three-way handshake attack, a DDoS denial of service, and Smurf attacks. So let's look at the SYN flood first. I want you to think about the TCP or the transport layer, right? And that there's a three-way handshake where we're having to make a connection before sending the information. Well, what can happen is with a SYN flood, the nefarious threat actor is constantly trying to make connections. So your network is, is setting up these sessions so that data and traffic can be sent through them. Well, if the network is so busy constantly creating these sessions so that 
traffic can move through them, it can't ever really move the traffic through them. So that is this constant three-way handshake problem, okay? A DDoS attack. So a DDoS attack is also sometimes called like a zombie attack. And that's because there'll be one threat actor, but they push the threat out to multiple end devices or host devices. And then they use those, which we call zombies, to be able to replicate and push out even more DOS attacks. So the zombie, right, these are like the handlers. So you go from having one threat actor to now you have all these extra zombies that are sharing in the responsibility of creating this attack. And then we have a Smurf attack. A Smurf attack is really just an attempt to overwhelm the WAN links, right? The wide area network links. So what's the difference between a DOS and a DDoS attack? A DDoS attack is similar to a DOS attack, but again, it's going to originate from multiple coordinated sources. It will start out with one threat actor, and then that threat actor infects several hosts. And then those hosts, the handlers or zombies, they now do the same job as the original threat actor. So instead of having one end device causing all these problems, we may have 20 zombies causing the problems. All right, so the threat actor down here creates multiple zombies and then sends these zombies out to different handlers. Now, every time the zombie device wants to talk to another device that isn't infected, boom, it hits and infects that one too. Just a quick summary of what we talked about with our network attacks. We covered malware, we covered a recon attack, we covered the different types of access attacks. And last we, lastly, we looked at denial of service attacks, the ping of death, the sin flood, the DDoS, and the Smurf attacks. The next part of our conversation will be for network attack mitigations. How do we stop this from happening? Network attack mitigation. So you want to think about this as an in-depth approach, right? Layering your mitigation. Really in today's networking, our networks are layered, right? Like the OSI model. So you got to think deep when it comes to mitigation. You have to think about what can I do at layer one? What can I do at layer two? What can I do at layer three, layer four? And then five, six, and seven, the application layer. You have to think of network attack mitigation in layers, okay? So there's several different security devices and practices and services that we can use. In this class, we really just touch on these things. However, in the next Cisco class, the second Cisco class, and the third Cisco class, we will go into these things deeper. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So the AAA server is one thing we'll talk about. Backups and updates. That's something that if you've been using a computer for a while, you should be familiar with those terms already. ASA firewalls, VPNs, IPS devices, ESA and WSA devices or software. Again, we'll talk about some of these things now and in future classes a lot deeper. See if you can answer this question. AAA network security services provide the primary framework to set up access control on a network device. What are the three A's of the AAA? Authentication. Who is permitted to access this resource this network, this web page, this account. Authorization. Once they're in there, right? Once they've been authenticated and they're in there, what are they authorized to do? Accounting. What actions they perform while accessing the resource? 
let's think about this in terms of school, right? So when you go to campus and you log into a school computer, you put in your username and your password. Who is permitted to access the resource, right? So it uses your username and your password to determine that. And then once you're in there, you will have certain authorizations where you can perform certain functions. Me as a teacher, when I log in, I'll have a different set of authorizations and functions. And then what actions they perform while accessing the resource. Think about Canvas. When I'm in Canvas, I can grade people's assignments. When you are in Canvas, you cannot, right? So that's a combination of authorization, plus it's keeping track of, it's making the, an accounting of what you're doing while you're in there and what I'm doing while I'm in there. The way AAA works is typically there will be a server on the network. Like at GCC, there is going to be a AAA server. And so every time you put your username and your password in, it goes to the authorization server and the authorization server verifies your username and your password, right? And then it'll, ver it'll go back to the AAA server to see what it is you are authorized to do. And then it will keep track of or an accounting of what you're doing. So that's going to be usually done on an external server that's attached to the network, right? Here's an example of a bank, right? I can log into the bank, right? And then once I'm in the bank, it'll tell me how much maybe I can send a check for or how much I can spend. And then notice the accounting. It keeps track of everything I've spent on my credit card or everything that I've taken out of my checking account. Another way for network attack mit mitigation is to keep backups. I'm going to bring us back to this Maricopa Community College situation that happened in March of 2021. I can only assume that Maricopa Community College keeps backups. That could be one of the reasons why it took so long to bring our systems back up. We may have had to go to a backup system and then restore everything from a backup system. So it's important to constantly be backing up your operating systems, your data. You never know when somebody might wipe it accidentally or purposely. Now, backups pretty much have to be done everywhere, right? You want to back up your intermediary devices like router and switches. Where we are the most familiar with it, though, would be our host devices, like our own computer. And then also our servers. It's a good idea to keep information that we store in our servers backed up, okay? So different considerations. How often do we form, perform the backups? Where are the backups going to be stored? Who will have access to the backups? Security. Backups should be transported to an approved offsite storage location. It may be cloud storage. It might be mag tape storage. And then validation. Backups also need to be protected with strong passwords. Backups are one of the easiest things we can do as regular network users, computer users, and then also even as a network administrator. Also perform your upgrades, your updates, and your patches. This is the easiest way to prevent worm attacks. Worms take advantage of known vulnerabilities in operating systems, um, port problems. So it's a really good thing to make sure you're always doing your upgrades. You can set those on automatic. You can set them to check every five days, every day. Run your updates. And if your operating system provider sends out a patch, run the patch. This will take care of worms pretty easily. Firewalls. Firewalls are another sure way to mitigate a network attack. And as a network administrator, this might be something that you will do the most, one of the functions that you will perform the most. So typically a firewall is gonna reside 
between two or more networks. Okay, And it's going to look at the traffic that goes through the firewall to determine and assess, is this traffic allowed to leave my network? It will also assess traffic coming from the outside in, and it will be, is this traffic allowed to come into my network? So a firewall could allow outside users controlled access to specific services. As an example, servers accessible to the outside users are usually located on a special network referred to as the demilitarized zone, the DMZ. The DMZ enables a network administrator to apply specific policy for hosts connected to that network. And again, the DMZ is typically going to be right outside of your local area networks or right outside of your where your WAN is connected. And as traffic comes in, it will go through different policies to assess whether or not that traffic will be allowed in. Here's an example of our firewall with traffic being looked at coming in and going out. Firewalls will deny outside traffic if it's not um, something that's been on the approved list. For example, something that I've seen companies do is they will not allow Facebook messages to come through, or they could prevent their employees from accessing Facebook from within their network. Here's an example of our DMZ server, and this might function with an outside person who's trying to gain access, and we want to allow them an access to certain areas of our network, but not all areas of our network. There's a few different types of firewalls. Sometimes these can be um, physical firewall types or software that's added. Okay, so we have packet filtering. Packet filtering is gonna look at the IP or the MACs, and it will allow or disallow based on IP addresses or IP networks. It will allow or disallow based on MAC addresses. So for example, in my home network, I don't allow MAC addresses that are unknown to my network onto my wireless router. Okay? Application filter. I can filter out specific types of applications. If I don't want to allow TFTP, for example, I can filter that. URL filtering, like we said, I could filter Facebook, I could filter eBay shopping, Amazon shopping. As the network administrator, I can apply these filters. Stateful packet inspection. So again, we could set up a device or set up software that would look at each packet and verify that it is a legitimate response to a request, meaning someone from inside my network made a request and that response is what I would allow. If somebody from outside the network is just trying to get in, well, we can reject that. An important part of network attack mitigations is endpoint security. We've already talked about some endpoint security. This would be our computer devices, our laptops, TVs, whatever's at the end, right, of your network, uh, printers, uh, smartphones, tablets. You want to make sure that you are running malware, antivirus, spyware protection, all of that stuff. Also make sure you have good policies if you're at a company for how, when updates should be done, backup should be done, antivirus software should be added. And then make sure your employees are well trained and that they're keeping to these and adhering to the policies. Again, here we're talking mostly about our end devices. Part four, device security. I want you to think about this question. For Cisco routers, there's a special feature that you can add that will help to assist securing your device and your system. What is that Cisco feature? And remember, a lot of times Cisco wants you to know the name of their special services and features when you take the CCNA. It is the Cisco Auto Secure. Uh, Cisco Auto Secure will just help you 
do some of these um, Cisco Auto Secure will help you enhance your security on your system. It doesn't make your system completely secure. You still want to do your everyday network administrator responsibilities in securing your network. So things you want to think about, change your default usernames, change any default passwords, limit your access. Don't allow just everybody in your company to access your network. Disable unnecessary services. At where we're at right now, we've mostly been talking about switches, right? Disable the switch ports that are not in use. Turn off CDP, right? Make sure that you are updating to the most recent operating system version uh, and do all of your patches and your updates when you take something out of the box. We've already talked about disabling the unused ports Again, that's one of the easiest things to do and will just prevent somebody from exploiting your service and getting in on your network when they shouldn't be. All right, this should be easy for us. Name three elements of a strong password. Why is it easy? Because we have to do it all the time. Banks make us do it. Schools makes us do it. Uh, where we work usually makes us do it. KeyPass is just an example of like a network, um, um, a password storage company that will keep a password for you so that you only have to use this one location for your password. Avoiding words, like don't just use the word administrator, flower, daughter, son, like don't do that. Don't use names, right? Always use eight or more characters. Really what I'm seeing is you should be using 16 characters. Avoid repetition. Like you don't want to do administrator, administrator, password, password. Okay. And you also don't want to use the same one over and over. Okay. Like repeating it that way. Use complex structures. Avoid using any personal information. Again, don't use your wife's name, your daughter's name, your parent name, things like that. Birthdays too easy to figure out. And then again, just key pass is a nice, easy way. There's a ton of those that are a nice, easy way to keep track of your passwords. What I do now is I just use passphrases, right? I come up with a big, long sentence and I use that. Uh, let's see, for your devices, we've talked about different things, right? Um, on our devices, we have talked about doing password length, um, time, a timeout, like if you haven't logged in with a certain amount of time, you get logged out. If you type a password in wrong, um, more than three times, you can get locked out. So there's a bunch of different ways that we've learned how to strengthen the security on our own devices in our class. So let's look at some of these, some of the ones that we've actually been doing in class. So if you see here, service password encryption. Service password encryption matches up to which one of these? Ensures all configured passwords have a minimum specified length. Automatically disconnects an idle user. Secures remote access. Encrypts the passwords in the configuration. Will block login attempts for specified number of seconds if there are three failed login attempts. All right, well, I hope you got encrypts the passwords in the configuration. Next, security password minimum length. Well, that one should be easy because it actually has minimum specified length in the description, right? So you can set a minimum length on your Cisco devices. Login block for 120 seconds after three attempts within 60 seconds, right? So if within 60 seconds I make three wrong attempts, it will lock me out for 120 seconds, okay? The exec timeout. The exec timeout, that will automatically disconnect an idle user. This is super helpful just in case you get up from your keyboard, you forgot to lock your screen, it will log you out, it'll disconnect you so that somebody else can't just come sit down and then get into your uh, system and get into your network devices. And lastly, SSH, secure remote access. 
I'm actually going to go through SSH at the end of this presentation in detail. So we'll look at um, SSH because that's something you'll be using all the time. These are important commands to practice, important commands to know. When you get into the industry, this is stuff you would be using all the time. Even if you are doing something in the cloud, you'll have to maintain security and passwords and set security, good security practices. Here's an example of what these look like right in the configuration. If you've been working your way through the modules and you've been working your way through the labs and packet tracers for the security module and anytime we've done SSH, you'll see that there is the need to use the login command. Well, we've added the login local. What is the difference between just using a login or the login local? This is also a really common question on the CCNA or a version of it. You'll have to understand the difference between these. So the login command is required configuration command to enable the password checking at login. So you would use this under the line con zero and or the line VTY 04, 015, et cetera. Now, what you can do is if you want to set up specific users, let's say you want to designate two people within your department, your IT department, to be able to access using the console or using the VTY lines, you can create a database and you can put those two names inside of the database. Well, if you're going to have a database and you're going to specify specific users, designate users, you have to create the login local. That tells the device to go look at the local database to see if this particular user is authorized. So you would assign them a username and a password. Okay. That is the difference between the login and the login local. A login local is going to be used when you set up a database of designated users and designated people that are allowed to access your network. Let's see. Here's an example of this. In this scenario, I have set up a, a user, Bob. The password that Bob would have to use is Cisco. And this is for access through the VTY lines. So notice if somebody, let's say I, right, attempted to get in through the VTY line and I entered a username of Andrea and a password of Cisco, this will go look at the username database and it will not see the username Andrea. I would be blocked. If Bob attempts to get in, it would go look at the username database and it would see Bob. As long as Bob has the right password, Bob would be allowed VTY access. Part five of network security, I'm going to go over SSH. When you are a network administrator, setting up SSH will just be an everyday thing for you. And so I'm going to go ahead and go through the steps of SSH using Packet Tracer. SSH is a way for you to secure access into your network devices. And what we normally use is Telnet. And Telnet is less secure because it's not encrypted. There's no hashing or anything. Well, SSH will encrypt your password, will encrypt all the information. So let's take a look. Here I have Packet Tracer up and I've got a router. And then I have just my basic SSH commands already in here. I'm not going to set all of the other common password commands and security that we need. I'm going to use this just to represent SSH. So we can see step one here is to configure a unique device host name. So I think we all know how to do that by now, right? So I'm going to call this the branch router, okay? Next, it wants us to configure a domain name. So we'll configure the IP domain name of the network in global mode. So we're just going to do IP domain name, and I'm going to call this Petopia. Like my business is, this is the branch office 
for my company Petopia. Next, it wants us to generate the key. So this is the crypto key. This is so that the traffic that's going to go across with SSH, all of it would be encrypted. OK, so notice SSH encrypts traffic between the source and the destination. Remember when we talked about so SSH is port 22, right? So port 22 gets opened up so that a session is created and that way I can push information through the session to my device. Well, everything within that session, if I'm using SSH, will be encrypted. Now I'm going to generate the crypto key. This will determine the length of the encryption hash. OK, so I'm going to use crypto. And if you don't know all of them, you can put the question mark key generate RSA question mark. Do you really want to replace them? Yes. Okay, so now it's asking me the modulus. That means what size, how many bits are going to get encrypted. And we can do anything from 512 up to, let's see, from 20 up to 2048. I'm going to do 1024. That's the minimum recommended. OK, so notice here it tells us generating 1024 bit RSA keys. The keys will be non exportable. OK, so what that means is I can't export it someplace because that would actually cause a vulnerability. All right, so we've generated our crypto key. Next, I have to create my local database. So this is my username. Now I'm going to go ahead and give, you know, Andrea access. I'm going to use an easy password. Again, we've already learned that we don't necessarily do that. I'm just doing it because of the example. Here is my username. All right. So I've now just set up the basics of SSH with my domain name, my crypto key, my username and password. Next, I have to actually apply this to the line VTY. So we're going to go into the line VTY. And I, I want to go ahead and get my password in there. Next, I'm going to tell it login local. So I'm saying that whenever someone logs in with a VTY using SSH, Please go look at the database and verify that they're actually authorized and that they have the right password. Next, I want to eliminate the ability of people to be able to get in with Telnet. I want to make this so that this device could only be accessed with SSH. So what I'm going to say is transport. So think about the transport layer, right? Layer four with the uh, with the port numbers, port 22 is open. So we're basically saying transport input. So if someone's trying to get in, right, input, then we want to use SSH, transport input SSH. I could also do transport input all, and that would allow SSH and Telnet. Or I could do transport input Telnet if I wanted to limit it to tel Telnet. In this case, though, we want to limit it to SSH. Now I'm going to do an exit. I should be good. So I've got all of my SSH commands set up. We can test this. OK, so first of all, let's just take a look at it. So we can do show run and let's do like begin SSH so that I'm looking at my SSH stuff. Let's verify this. Let's do a show IP SSH. So I can see that SSH is, is enabled. Notice here that SSH has some default timeouts. See, it's got 120 seconds automatically. I could change that and make it something different. And you have to authenticate within three tries. All right, I'm going to test this. And I've already added an interface connection onto my router. And now I have my PC added and an address. So from Packet Tracer, what we can do 
is use the Telnet SSH client. This looks a little different in Packet Tracer than it would look if we were using an actual host device. With a host device, you could use the software uh, platform of Telnet. You could use PuTTY, or you could even go through the command prompt. Again, it looks a little different in Packet Tracer. All right, so the IP address that I set up on the router's default gateway is 192.168.0.1. And the username, if you remember, was Andrea. And so now I'm going to click Connect. Notice how it's asking me for a password. Now, this would be the password that we set up for the user. So I'm going to enter the password. Now it's put me into the device just as if I had gone into the device directly from Telnet. So I'm going to enter Enable. Now notice it's asking me for another password. Now this is going to be the password to get into user privileged mode, which we normally set up as Cisco or class. So there, I've entered in that. Now I can just get in there like any other, uh, any other connection into the device. And I'm in. So there, that is SSH for you. Again, I do like it and I recommend if students practice this SSH command a lot, commands a lot so that you get really comfortable with it. Here's an example of it built out in the regular command line. You'll see here um, the host name, the domain name that was set up. They have done a crypto key modulus 1024. Depending upon the version, sometimes you type out the crypto key generate RSA all on one line. Other times you have to hit the enter with a different version. I think it's version 12 and then enter the modulus. Here we've set up the username and password, the login local and transport SSH. That's pretty much it for this module on network security fundamentals. This is just a funny little joke uh, about one of our technicians who has set up a really strong password. The problem is they have a sticky note next to their computer with what their password is. Have a good one.